el encanto que nace con cada día en el Ecuador. Aguarda a los estudiantes de la Universidad de las Fuerzas Armadas, ESPE. Su campus con extensas áreas verdes, instalaciones de primera y su fácil accesibilidad la convierten en el lugar idóneo para el aprendizaje integral universitario. Su sólido fundamento desde sus inicios en 1922 de formar profesionales del más alto nivel académico que contribuyan al desarrollo del país le mantienen incursionando en varios proyectos de investigación enfocados al avance tecnológico y de conocimiento, aportando continuamente con publicaciones científicas de alto impacto, anexados en la base de datos Scopus y levantando proyectos vinculados con la sociedad, enfocados a mejorar la calidad de vida de las personas. La investigación científica es la que mueve las sociedades, los países, porque a través de ella se dan los nuevos descubrimientos, se dan los desarrollos tecnológicos. La ESPE fomenta la investigación científica a través del financiamiento de proyectos de investigación en donde participan profesores y estudiantes de la universidad. La investigación militar en la Universidad de las Fuerzas Armadas es uno de los pilares fundamentales. Sea esta como una integración tecnológica o como una investigación aplicada, nos ha permitido subsanar necesidades operativas de Fuerzas Armadas. El trabajo conjunto entre militares y docentes es uno de los factores importantes dentro de esta universidad. Yo veo los proyectos de vinculación de parte de la ESPE como una oportunidad. Como lo mencionó la escritora pentapléjica venezolana Olga Bejano, ya dijo, ¿es este mundo un mundo con acceso para todos? No lo es, pero podría llegar a serlo y todo depende de todos nosotros. Y eso es lo que trata de hacer los proyectos de vinculación, que todos los conocimientos adquiridos en clases eh, tratemos de ser proyectos no solo novedosos o interesantes, sino que estos proyectos ayuden a personas a mejorar su calidad de vida. Maestros, investigadores y alumnos comprometidos, convirtiendo la enseñanza y el aprendizaje en herramientas de desarrollo para alcanzar los objetivos del Plan Nacional del Buen Vivir desde la matriz en Sangolquí y cruzando límites con sus extensiones en La Tacunga, Santo Domingo de los Áchilas y las unidades académicas especiales. Es así que 23.000 estudiantes son parte de la plataforma educativa con la que cuenta la Universidad de las Fuerzas Armadas, ESPE. Estudiantes que se forman en una de las mejores universidades del país, en instalaciones de calidad y laboratorios con tecnología de punta, con el fin de desarrollar investigación científica. Se orienta hacia la excelencia académica, contribuyendo al progreso del Ecuador mediante su estructura académica departamental. Ciencias exactas. Ciencias de la vida, ciencias de la tierra y la construcción, ciencias humanas y sociales, ciencias de la computación, ciencias económicas, administrativas y de comercio, energía y mecánica, eléctrica y electrónica, seguridad y defensa, tecnologías, idiomas. La ESPE ha logrado consolidar su posicionamiento como una de las universidades líderes en nuestro país. Esto hace que los estudiantes confiemos en la formación académica que nos brinda, porque desarrollamos competencias para contribuir al progreso y desarrollo del Ecuador. A través del centro de posgrado, sustenta el quehacer académico e investigativo. A la vez, fortalece uno de sus objetivos, empresa-sociedad, por medio de la vinculación. Esto lo consigue con diversos programas de enfoque intermultidisciplinar en cada una de las maestrías que ofrece. La ESPE promueve cursos de educación continua con el fin de actualizar permanentemente los conocimientos de profesionales y ciudadanía en general para contribuir con el desarrollo local, nacional y regional. Además, la universidad fortalece su sistema educativo por medio de convenios con otras instituciones a través del programa de movilidad académica para estudiantes y docentes, ofreciendo pasantías y becas. Los convenios internacionales entre las universidades representan un beneficio mutuo que soporta y facilita el intercambio de conocimientos en las diferentes áreas de investigación y educación. Al mismo tiempo, ayuda a la movilidad de los estudiantes para obtener una mejor experiencia académica y para tener una mejor formación profesional. Mi experiencia en Brasil fue maravillosa, eh, compartimos con estudiantes de 12 países donde intercambiamos eh, varias información sobre culturas y sobre información política, económica, información sobre la universidad. 
La Universidad de las Fuerzas Armadas ESPE también es la generadora de pensamiento estratégico en seguridad y defensa. También está el sistema Alumni, que le permite al graduado mantener una identidad con la universidad, accediendo a los diferentes servicios y asesoramientos que la institución posee para coadyuvar en su desarrollo profesional. Los logros científicos alcanzados por la Universidad de las Fuerzas Armadas, ESPE, su relevante labor académica y de investigación, su creciente prestigio nacional e internacional, tienen relación con una sólida estructura de gestión, lo cual se demuestra a través de su compromiso permanente con el futuro de la patria y su voluntad de servir a los ecuatorianos. Yo amo mi ESPE. Porque me lleva a aportar con lo que sea a mi gente. Porque me abre las puertas al conocimiento. Y me hace saber que con mi ayuda se construye un mejor mañana para mi país. Universidad de las Fuerzas Armadas ESPE. Innovación para la excelencia. Yeah, maybe. Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the last session of this International Congress organized by Pedagogía de los Idiomas Nacionales y Extranjeros, major at Universidad de las Fuerzas Armadas, ESPE. My name is Maria Teresa Yumikinga, and I will be the responsible for moderating this live session. Before starting, I must mention a message from one of our technicians. He told us that yesterday they sent a wrong link for the activity, but if you completed those open questions, do not worry. It will be considered for your grade anyway. So you do not need to repeat the activity again. Another thing that I must remind is that the attendance links will be posted. Please be alert. Well, let's begin our first presenter today. Dr. Rijasu Andiamanena, PhD from the University of Maja, Mahajanga, Madagascar. If you have questions for Rijasu, please add them in the chat and she will be able to answer some of them at the end. About her background, Rijasu has gotten a captain a certification in English language and later in Madagascar. Uh, she has a master's degree in French studies at the University of New Mexico in the USA. She has gotten also the PhD in language literacy and social cultural studies at the University of New Mexico in the USA. Currently, she's an assistant professor at the University of Mahajinga fields of research, foreign language teaching and learning, multilingualism, identities and cultures, participatory action research, teachers' professional development. Rija Su will deal with the topic smile, inquire and engage, some language teaching strategies in time of COVID-19. Brief summary of her presentation. Drawn from a participatory action research, this interactive presentation discusses language teaching strategies adopted in times of COVID-19 using a communalizing and liberating perspective that promotes the student-teacher partnership and freedom of thought and behavior. It describes classroom students and activities that led to a unifying community built, hope filled an emancipating environment despite the pandemic era. Rijasu, please, this space is totally yours. Thank you so much uh, for the introduction and um, good evening, good morning, everybody it depends on where you are. And thank you so much for having me and especially for this uh, beautiful introduction. 
I am also happy to be here and I would like to greet um, the 200 and plus audience who follow us. And um, I, I am uh, starting uh, this uh, presentation. Okay. All right. <clears throat> As introduced uh, earlier, uh, I am uh, an applied research in education. So that means I like to collaborate with teachers and students when I do my research. It's not just about creating a theory and then go into the classroom and test if it works, but it's about a bottom approach where collaborative efforts come together and um, bring a solution to a real classroom issue. Mm, how do I go next with this slide? Uh, okay, there you go. Okay, so uh, here's the agenda. First, I'm going to talk about schooling problems uh, during uh, COVID times, uh, during COVID-19. And then I would explain why do those problems matter? And I came up with a question and uh, the study. And then uh, the strategies that we discovered in the classroom. As I said, this is not just about um, designing or uh, designing um, a solution, but it's about implementing it as well. And uh, I'm gonna talk about the lessons that we learned and then uh, implication of this presentation. So at the end of this presentation, my hope is that we can gain something that can be applied directly in a language uh, classroom. So how it all started, uh, here is the country of Madagascar on my, um, on the other side of the screen. So Madagascar is a country east of um, Africa. It is an island and um, it is a Madagascar, the country, not the movie. So we are a country before it was a movie. <coughs> Excuse me. And then um, when I was the, Department Secretary of Education uh, in Madagascar, the Minister of Education during the COVID time. I presented an educational TV program for uh, students because uh, they couldn't go to school. So the problem with that was uh, it, uh, the program mainly reached the um, urban population and people in the rural area could not do technology. And that came the idea that no, we need to reach all students regardless of their situation. So that's how I started to deal with um, the real school problems because in Madagascar, 90% of our people still live in the rural area. And um, the students or the pupils uh, experienced low attendance, high dropouts, and then shortened hours. So during the COVID times. And um, when teachers teach at school, there's a negligence of um, social and economic problems. Teachers continue to teach regardless of the situation. They tend to ignore that there are other situations that come with the students when they go to school. And that is because nobody and we are not uh, are prepared for this pandemic. Like, how is it gonna be? How is it gonna affect us? So that's the second issue of that. And the third issue I already mentioned is the inexperience of rural education. We tend to put everything together in one a bucket, education is education. So let's adopt the 
strategies for just education and it's up to the rural people to adapt to 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 adjust and the problem with rural areas for example electricity technology the culture is completely diff completely different from the urban and then despite of all of those issues the teachers training remains inadequate so um the system the structure of the country uh, mostly focus on how to transmit, but not on the whole issue, not the holistic view of um, education or the schooling problem during the pandemic. Those problems matter because first, learners receive insufficient educational content. Again, uh, it seems like teaching is rushed because uh, we don't have uh, enough time and sometimes when the uh, case surge and then uh, we just have to shorten school and do whatever it can be uh, it can be done and then the other problem is teachers ignore the pandemic impacts on learners on learners physical cognitive emotional and relational capacities the pandemics affect uh, all those uh, sides of, um, of uh, the learners, not only their um, physical, like when they get sick, but it's hard to operate cognitively and emotionally and rela relationally when uh, uh, during the pandemic time. And also the rural schools, as I already mentioned, cannot adopt the urban education model for the COVID-19 era. So that's also, uh, a problem and the biggest, I guess. And lastly, the teachers lack training in how to teach in time of uncertainty. Teachers are used to teach in a structured, in a normal time. And when it comes to time of uncertainty, it's hard for them to adjust because uh, most of them don't receive that training. So here's a question that came into uh, my team's mind when we did uh, this study, what strategy can be used and effective for language teaching in times of COVID-19? So strategies that can be used and at the same time effective. There are strategies that can be only used, but they are not effective. But we would like to suggest and we use strategies that are both uh, useful and can be applied and then effective as well with the result driven. Now, let me talk briefly about the study. As I mentioned earlier, this is a participatory action research study. So um, there are steps that we followed. So there's the planning and uh, we plan together with the teachers and with um, uh, the trainers. I work with the three trainers, then we do action and then we do observation and then reflection, and then we redo it again when we go into the classroom. So that's the cycle that we follow. So the perspective or the lens that we adopt, uh, we adopted for that is the communalizing and liberating perspective. So that is uh, driven, uh, that was drawn from my dissertation study in 2019 when I did my work with the teachers during the time of uh, the plague, the uh, plague that is the epidemic that hit Madagascar then. So uh, it says that um, change, uh, change by working with colleagues and students to explore teaching and learning issue, learning issues. That means um, uh, we need to look for the change in the classroom not by working by ourselves, but uh, with um, the colleagues and students. Often our teaching is only limited to a one-way um, thing that we give and our students are given. And the colleagues, uh, we don't involve our colleagues. So that's the first thing in a communalizing and liberating uh, approach is that we need to work together. And the second uh, thing is, uh, the local classroom community agrees on uh, what thinking and behaviors are accepted 
and what are not based on multilateral decision. So the uh, rules are not imposed, but we found together a way to agree on something. And then lastly, constantly finding ways of understanding, questioning, and, uh, te and improving teaching beliefs and practice. So we are not happy with one thing, but we always want to improve always and always constantly. So that means we don't have one thing uh, firm and set. So the participants for this study are uh, three teacher trainers and then 18 classroom teachers uh, that happened at nine elementary schools in uh, different southern villages of Madagascar. So this is quite of um, people to do this. And then uh, the data came from classroom visits, the trainers training, the trainers meeting, uh, our researchers journal, uh, the meetings with classroom uh, teachers, and then a meeting with students. So the data we collected are class visit checklists. So that is when the teachers visit the classroom of their colleague, they have um, some uh, paper and then they record what's happening in the classroom. And then we use students work samples, the teacher's lesson plan, the, their materials, uh, class level curricula. We ask the teacher to reflect. So we use their reflections uh, questionnaire, interview response, meeting notes, and then other, uh, after the meeting with the teachers, we have some prompts and then they provide the answer. Okay, so here are the strategies that we discovered after we analyzed uh, the data. So the strategy one is smile. I know it's uh, basic, but during COVID time, it's hard even to smile for everybody. Uh, I hope it's the same, uh, maybe it's better somewhere else, but in Madagascar, life has been depressing and um, it's hard to smile. So the teacher would come to the classroom like this, you know, with a sad face. So we encourage them to incorporate fun activities like song, dance, clap, and movement, and then adding uh, humorous stories to the lesson and uh, keep, keeping them um, smiling during teaching session. So for example, as we see from the screen here, this is uh, a clapping activity that brings smile in the classroom. So that's um, one of the teachers who worked with us who teaches um, kindergarten. And then um, this is part of the activity that uh, can bring smile in the classroom while uh, teaching uh, language. And then a humorous story that brings smile. This is um, a teacher who is trying uh, to read uh, a story to the students and then um, uh, to bring smile. So instead of just sitting at the bench, they are gathered together uh, here and so that they can see uh, the story in the book and then trying um, to make uh, learning more fun. And then smiling where, when teaching is, uh, this is a, a group of students working on something. And then um, we try, I try to smile uh, with them. This is me uh, in the red uh, sweatshirt. And um, yeah, so that is like, we try to project smile so that it's contagious to the students. The strategy two is inquire, asking questions. So um, the traditional way of teaching is always uh, saying the um, affirmative sentences, like, or uh, uh, do the order, do this. But then posing questions on uh, current realities or student real lives invites students to talk. So even if, um, uh, it is simple question. The goal is to make them participate and talk. So teacher needs to inquire. And then the question that asked should be age and content appropriate. And lastly, the questions that uh, 
need to be asked during inquiry is uh, using open-ended questions with multiple possible answers. So it's not in language teaching, we tend to, for example, put the text on the board and then uh, the students are asked to answer just one question, you know, the, the, uh, uh, one, we, a question with just one possible answer. So, and then it tends to be uh, who, fought, who found the right answer and who got the wrong answer, but that's not the point here. The point here is the questions asked should be open-ended and with multiple uh, possible answer. And then once we ask question on current realities, like what we see on the board here on the picture, for example, for example um, what do you do to prevent or treat diarrhea? So those are uh, students are put in groups and then they know like um, uh, this uh, girl here is like, uh, well, uh, boil the water. So this is something that they, are taught already, they know because diarrhea during the time of um, COVID was very common. And um, uh, those are the questions uh, that we asked in the classroom to invite them to participate. And then asking age appropriate question, can you raise your right hand actually in here? So those are preschool children. It's hard for them to know the, what is left and what hand is right. So that's appropriate age, appropriate question. So they're trying to show their right hand here and the teacher is leading the activity. And open-ended questions like, what animals do you raise at home? Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier in Madagascar, we have a, a agricultural population. So people raise animals. And when you talk about animals, uh, most students have animals at home, like chickens and ducks and stuff. And what do you eat for breakfast in the morning? So those are with the, the answer for those are different. Who are the people in your family? How many brothers and sisters do you have? So the answers of those questions will lead to language. So they produce language and they are learning from that without being uh, uh, pressured. And the strategy free, that teachers uh, uh, can be used as use, use, can be used as effective is engage. Um, again, uh, it, it teachers engage students by implementing group work, pair work, or tree work. So it's not anymore about pointing one student like um, uh, Pat, Pat, Patricia. You go to the board. What is the answer of this? But putting students in group so that it is. Um, it releases them from the stress. And then uh, changing setting uh, from time to time. So outdoor, in the field, or in circle, sitting on the floor, as we saw earlier. And then alternating activities, um, writing, speaking, drawing, moving, singing, doing arts. Again, this is um, a, a way to avoid boredom as well. And then uh, it is very learning enhanced. And let's see, for example, here, engaging students with group work. So this is how students, when they work on one um, uh, assignment and they work together, this is just one group of students. So uh, it saves time with the teacher, uh, for the teachers. And then it also help, uh, helps them to bring the students together. And engaging students with outdoor activity. For example, this is a very um, tropical village in the rainforest and it's very muddy, but when, when during this time, it was uh, a little bit sunny and the teacher tried to do some outdoor activities. And as you can see, their uh, smiling face and they enjoy uh, doing it. And then with engaging students with drawing activity, so um, often um, this is very important, but uh, we teachers tend to neglect that drawing is a way of expressing. And this they are learning, uh, uh, they, they draw, uh, for example, there's on, on your right, there's the pineapple because that is what they grow. And then there's the uh, bull too. And then they try to learn what's the name of this uh, and then this is producing language. 
so they know how to write it and then how to say it and um, how to draw it as well. So these are the lessons learned uh, during the study. During times of COVID, then teachers need to unify students because there are different um, perspectives. There are different uh, uh, things that separate students' ideas and everything. And then um, I think the teachers have the responsibility to unify students. For example, if there are stu uh, students who are sick of COVID, they, are tend, they tend to be excluded in the classroom or in the family there was a time. And they, oh, we don't wanna hang out with you because you may bring us COVID. And it's up to the teacher, even if the COVID is already over, they still remember like so-and-so's parent died of COVID. So let's um, not come together with that student. But it is up to the teacher to unify the students and then build the teacher-student community. Because in the time of uncertainty, um, people need to come together to deal, to face uh, the pandemic time. And then bring in hope. People are hopeless. People didn't want to, to cooperate. People didn't want to face life. So the teacher need to bring uh, hope. And then find learning enhanced activities. It's not just filling up the mind of the books of students with information, but it has to be, uh, the activities have to be learning enhanced. And then emancipate students. Students have little hope during the pandemic time. So they need to keep dreaming, to keep following, chasing their um, dream. So that's the work of the teacher. And the implication of this uh, um, presentation is for uh, cultures and language teaching. So the necessity and appropriateness of welcoming, acknowledging, celebrating the classroom community members and their background. So now it's time to um, not isolate language teaching with cultures because again, uh, this population, for example, it's a um, rural population. So in the classroom, it's now time to welcome the different uh, background of uh, the learners. And then for perspectives on language teaching, multilingualism, as you see, there were some Malagasy words uh, and then the local cultures and then mutual agreement in the classroom for language development. And then stressing the community of teachers. So community is, um, uh, the key here, because uh, we can't do language teaching by ourselves. We need to involve the whole community. And lastly, when we prepare teacher in the teacher um, training college, we need to value collectivity and then decolonial approaches instead of just you know grammar mastery, vocabulary accumulation, language fluency, and Western world discovery. And I come to the end of this presentation. Thank you so much for your um, attention. And um, I give the floor to our moderator. Thank you. Thank you, Rija Sue, for such an amazing presentation. We are sure that the audience enjoyed it. And now we have some questions for you. Number one, in your opinion, what was an effective teaching strategy for students during the COVID-19 times? Yes, uh, if I can tell, I already mentioned the strategies, but if I can tell just one is the last one, engage. So we need to engage with our students in order to understand what in their head. That means we need to build a relationship you know, in order to understand someone or a situation, we need to establish a good, a positive relationship first. And once we establish that relationship, we can engage with them. We can talk to them. So teaching in time of uncertainty is not a one-way communication. It should be both ways. It should be in the form of discussion. It should, it should be in the form of um, exchange. It should be not only centered on a 
specific content, but it should touch the real lives, real context, so that we can get real um, input for from students and they can use the information they receive, the education that they receive in real life. So I think we need to get out of the box. We need to leave the traditional, the classic method of teaching language like, okay, let's learn um, uh, conditional. It's like this. No, but if you learn conditional, let's say, what if, what would you do uh, after COVID is over? And then students would have dream and that's how they learn conditional instead of just giving the rules that can be uh, nonsensical to them. So I would say then for one strategy would be engage, engage and engage the student. Okay, thank you. The next question, what, what aspects should be taken into account when establishing strategies for the teaching process? Uh, what, uh, I'm sorry, I, uh, what? What aspects should be taken into account when establishing the strategies for the teaching process? Yes, the aspect, the number one aspect that we need not to forget is students are human. They are human being before they are your students. And the hu all human beings on this planet have experienced COVID-19 to one extent or another one. They have lived it, they have experienced it, they have loved ones who died from it. So please don't disconnect the real lives of the students, their uh, pandemic situation when you teach them. So they are human, they're scared. Children are scared, children are uh, threatened, children are uh, terrorized, children don't have uh, any hope, they are not even sure of what happens if they can gonna make this. So we, we should be easy on them, we should bring hope because um, they are human and they can be weak, they can't express like us adults. When we are scared, we adults, we can say like, wow, I'm worried about this pandemic because now the end, and then she visited us, we got, but children cannot do that. They keep the fear inside them and we can't necessarily see it uh, right away, but they have it. So please understand that they are human and they are impacted as well and adjust your teaching, your activities, your perspective, especially accordingly. Thank you. Okay, thank you. In your experience, what strategies can be implemented in rural areas to encourage the learning of the English language? Yes, um, as I already mentioned, for uh, rural um, uh, children, uh, we need to go back uh, to the traditional one, to the very simple. Um, no PowerPoint, no much materials, but the basic materials use the body of the students, use the environment uh, situation there, bring them outside, have them play. And then for example, um, if uh, they learn, uh, let's say they are learning about um, uh, the forest and then have them collect uh, something outside and then uh, they bring, they know it, uh, the, the things in the, their native language, and then they would translate, they would bring, uh, they would build a sentence out of it, and that is language. For example, our environment um, is composed of, uh, you know, baobab tree, this, this, so that is language on how to use um, words in a certain situation so that they can express it in different languages. It's not just building words together like taking random sentences, right? Before the, listen, the birds are singing where there's no even birds or the, uh, you know, the, the flies are uh, playing or the kids are 
uh, watching TV. You know, those are the classic words, random words, but it should be uh, words um, to, to develop language in rural areas, words that are relevant to them. So how can they use that English language in a um, uh, useful way so that they can communicate and they can express themselves and talk about their reality instead of a virtual one, instead of the Western world, which is very disconnected from their real life. Uh, thank you. Um, and the last question, do you consider that teachers can develop hope or motivation in students through virtual education? Um, yes, that's a, that's a good question. Um, since my population here is mostly uh, uh, rural children, so it doesn't apply to them because they can't even, there's no electricity or power in that. But the virtual um, education could be very effective if all the students have adequate access to internet and to the infrastructure. And parents have to be involved in um, uh, follow up. It cannot be the only teacher's job to that moment because teachers cannot control what is, is not um, in the classroom, in the virtual classroom. It doesn't depend on the teachers anymore. What the teachers can do is to create enriching activities that can engage students, but the rest, like the time, are they gonna be there? It has to be um, coordinated with the parents and with um, a school administration as well, with the support of, um, in a way or another, like how to do that. So it has to be very much organized and uh, with a campaign that is um, strategic to do that. But I think virtual education can work. Okay, thank you, Richa Su. We appreciate the eloquence in your responses you have provided. And now we want to show our gratitude by granting you a certificate, which says, <clears throat> let's see, okay. I think it's appearing. Universidad de las Fuerzas Armadas ESPE, Depar Department of Human and Social Sciences, Certificate of Participation. This is to certify that Richa Su Menana has participated as a keynote speaker in the Pedagogía de los Idiomas Nacionales y Extranjeros uh, to, uh, 2022 Congress with a presentation entitled smile, inquire, and engage some language teaching strategies in times of COVID-19, held at the Universidad de las Fuerzas Armadas de Este in San Golquí. And the two authorities are signing this document. Marco Rosales, the director of the Department of Human and Social Sciences, as well as Miguel Ponce, the director of Pedagogía de los Idiomas Nacionales y Extranjeros program. Thanks again, dear Richa Sue. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay. Next, we have the pleasure to welcome our second presenter, Fabian Chavez Pazmiño a public speaker with, with 21 years of teaching experience. Before that, remember you can write your questions in the chat section. And at the end of the presentation, Fabian will answer the questions from the audience. Let's talk about his background. Fabian has a bachelor's degree in English teaching certifications in online teaching by Cambridge Assessment English. C2 Certificate of Common U U European Framework and a Certificate of Proficiency in English by Michigan. Fabian has been a teacher trainer for Cambridge Assessment English 
a Cambridge speaking examiner for levels A2, B1, and B2. He has a CELTA certification as a qualified teacher at the University of Cambridge. He's the author of the book for Social Studies for Ecuador, 2-4. Currently, he is the academic coordinator at Cambridge School of Languages. He will present the workshop Flipped Lessons and Task-Based Learning, TBL. Let's see a brief summary about his presentation. Nowadays, empowering students to own their learning is essential and traditional models are not enough in a world where technology develops in leaps and bounds. Therefore, new alternatives such as flipped lessons and task-based learning can make a positive impact on the way our students learn. Let's please welcome our second presenter, Fabian Chavez. Welcome, Fabian. Hello, thank you very much for that lovely introduction. I feel really honored uh, to have been invited to this uh, first Congress organized by the Army University. I want to thank you, Evelyn, for always taking me into account for, for sharing uh, some of my experience as a teacher. Now that I am um, playing a role as an academic coordinator, what I'm trying to do is to share what I, I've learned with the people who work with me. But I feel really happy to spend this Friday afternoon with you. And um, let's begin. All right. So. Okay, so you were very kind to uh, introduce my, my professional experience. So thank you for that. Uh, and I would go straight to the point. Um, you know that because of COVID-19 and the political crisis around the world, um, we have suffered uh, a major impact, especially on education um, unexpectedly all teachers had to transition from being in the classroom to going online. And that was a difficult change. I always tell people, uh, believe it or not, many years ago, we used to talk about the future of education and the students used to answer questions uh, and say, I think that in the future we won't need classrooms, we will just need computers, we will be online. And now we are living the future, but the question is if we are really prepared for it. Uh, and for that reason, I, I've noticed that it is time to change and we need to find strategies to be able to reach all learners. Uh, even when they are far from the classrooms or when they are in, in, in the classrooms, the generations have changed as well. And it is important for us to consider the strategies that we will be talking about today. So in today's uh, presentation, I will talk to you about conventional approaches uh, and three different models to reach all, all learners, flipped lessons, task-based learning, and learning centers. So let's start with the traditional model. Uh, I'm going to invite everyone to participate, people who are here on the, in the Zoom session. Uh, I would like you guys to take um, some time to join the activities that I've prepared for you. So here, I don't know if, if um, this material was shared, but I'm going to share the link in the chat box. Please feel free to open the link. And let's start working. So the first thing that I would like to discuss with you is this uh, conventional 
uh, approaches, uh, such as the PPP. If you have access to your microphone and you can uh, just answer very quickly, does anyone remember what PPP stands for? Or you can use the chat box. I know that uh, your mics might not be working. I'll give you a, a hint. The first one, uh, it's presentation. Do you remember the other two? Practice and production. Excellent. Thank you very much. So yeah, typically uh, we know how these uh, lessons work, but now the thing is that when I observe some online classes, teachers follow this model. We just share the book on the screen. We ask the students to complete activities after we have given some explanation of the target language. And at the end, we want them to practice. So we have uh, transferred the, the, PP model, the PPP model to a virtual environment. Uh, and to have an idea of how this works, uh, I am going to open breakout rooms and I would like you guys to open the link in activity eight. The link there will open this lovely jumper here. This is a typical PPP lesson where step number one is when students read a short biography and answer two or three questions about that. What I would like you to do is uh, just open the link, go to the jumper and rearrange the steps numbers two through seven. So let me just check if you have permission to edit. Great. So now you have access. Great, so here you have different rooms. We're not going to open breakout rooms. We are few people, but just feel free to uh, start playing with numbers. How do you think the model works? Can anyone help me uh, in the microphone? What do you think the correct order is? Just go for it. Oh, I see that someone is already online. Great. Hmm, so in room number one, someone is helping. Great. Remember that you also have another slide here. Uh-huh. So someone is telling me the students complete gap field tasks. Uh-huh, the teacher underlines a sentence in the text, which includes the target language and asks students to find more examples. Oh, okay, that person changed uh, their mind. Pretty good. You can also go to rooms number two, three. Later, we can compare answers. Stay two more minutes. I'm gonna be here in room number two. Can anyone help me please and tell me what do you think the second one is? People uh, can participate, just feel free to, to tell me and, and I will help you out. Marco, I see your name there. What do you think the, the second step is? Interesting. Can you say it again, please? Very interesting. Oh, what do you think step number two is? Or Priscilla? In the meantime, room number one, someone is still working.
Priscilla, are you there? Or Magus? Do they have the microphones activated? Uh, hi, Fabian, none right. of them have it. All so right. I was wondering if we can send the link to... to oh, sure. To the the link is, is here in activity A. You just need to open it, but I'm gonna share it anyway. So let me just copy the link, right? There we have, uh-huh. Perfect, so the link is in the chat box now. And then I will see when everyone connects. Choose a slide. There are seven. Okay, feel free to just play with numbers and try to set it up in the right order. Evelyn, would you like to help me with number two? Yeah, I was, I was, I was reading, but I was not sure. Um, no worries. Probably the student, because the first one is students read a short um, biography of That's a story right. mm -hmm. and answer questions two and mm -hmm. questions two to three about mm -hmm. it, right? Mm -hmm. That's correct. And probably uh, we could go. To, uh, students compare their answers and discuss, but I'm not sure oh, if they are going to no, discuss about no the worries. question or just, the grammar. <laughs> no worries. It's exercise just uh, to remember how this model works. Okay. So, okay. We have students compare their answers to discuss the meaning of the target language. What would be the third step? Perhaps uh, someone in the room can help us. I have Judith, Roberto. If you have your microphones uh, activated, just feel free to. Maybe the number two is the student who are in pairs, the fewer in the structure on TL. Okay. So someone is telling me a students work in purse. So mm -hmm. here we have the second one. Thank you. Anyone else? Number three. The student complete a gap field task. Okay. Number four, a green sentence which contain the TL. The target language, okay. <laughs> or just following the same order. Curious. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What do you think the next one could be? The next. Is the, the next is the next. <laughs> Number five. Of course. The underlying sentence in the new text, which includes TLNS, to find our examples. All right. Thank you. Ah, sorry, 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 sorry. Maybe underline, underline sentence is okay. number number six. No, because it's underline sentence is before. Mm -hmm. Maybe it, it is the number five. Underline sentence is content TL. Okay. You think that one is number five? Yes. Okay. Good. We have four more to go. But I got 20. Okay, let me check I'm here. Playing I am playing alone. Anyone you can have, feel free to, to participate. You have to give me a special gift. Yeah, of course. 
I'm so proud of you. Don't forget. Yeah, very positive. But yeah, very, yeah, that's right. I will. <laughs> so which right. one do you think the next one could be? Maybe in my opinion, it's the number six. Um, underline sentence. Okay. Students compare the answers. Okay. Mm, the the drills. Drills. Okay. Drills? Oh yeah, and then maybe in the last step is mingle. Students yeah. mingle and share their own autobiographies. Okay. I, suppose. I am not sure. sure. No worries, Alejandro. Thank you very much for your help. The idea of these kind of activities is just to activate what we know, remember uh, uh, some basic concepts, and then we will just check. Okay, so here we have let me just go for it. So here we have the answer. So yeah, first the teacher introduces the target language using a short biography. Then we go through meaning, form, and pronunciation, right? Underlining sentences, comparing answers, discussing the meaning of the target language, doing some drilling to practice pronunciation, and then some control practice with rearranging sentences with, which contain the target language, and finally, when students mingle and share their own autobiographies, they are uh, following this freer practice stage where the uh, apparently the target language is uh, practiced freely, right? Uh, however, this model brings uh, some disadvantages. Um, the, the method is too teacher center as it is only the teacher who presents the target language. It is the teacher who's responsible for designing the exercises and doing the talking. Since it is focused on, on uh, accuracy, the students have fewer opportunities to practice fluency. And yeah, they might feel just not interested in following the class. And there is no time for production and of course, the, one of the biggest disadvantages is uh, the model does not consider other learning styles. There are advantages though. For instance, it is easy to prepare, especially at lower levels. It can help students get uh, familiar with learning routines and the stages so that they can predict what's gonna happen in the classroom. And the materials are graded from the most simple to the most difficult. But the question is, how can we engage a wider range of learners? I don't want my students to feel bored. I don't want my students uh, not to have the opportunity to produce language. So there are other options. And here is where we have the flipped classrooms and task-based lessons. Here, I have prepared two activities for us to work. Um, let me open this and let's do this together. First, let's discuss the flipped lessons. In the flipped models, uh, students are going to access content beyond the classroom they, and they will be able to manipulate that content. Um, and this will give the teacher time to monitor the activities. Here, we're going to watch a, a video about flip lessons. And I would like you guys to answer. You can use the chat box and just drop your answers there. Let's begin. The flipped classroom. Let's reverse where traditional homework and lecture take place. Now, I must warn you beforehand, watching this presentation can literally turn your world upside down. The first thing most educators are going to ask is why flip? Well, here are a couple reasons to consider. With a flipped classroom, the content becomes available to students beyond typical classroom time. 
students are now able to access the content anytime. Benefit that comes with viewing content in video format is the ability to stop, pause, play, etc. Students can write down questions about the content at home. Then, when students enter the classroom, they are already prepared to ask these questions to their teacher. When a teacher flips a classroom, that teacher is able to walk around the room. Ultimately, flipping a classroom frees up time for teachers to work with students individually. Okay, so what is true about flipped lessons? Just a minute here. Just a second, please. Okay, so here we have. What is true about flipped classrooms? Well, here we have different options. So the idea is to tick. What do you think from what you heard? To their teacher. When a teacher flips a classroom, that teacher is able to walk around the room. Ultimately, flipping a classroom frees up time for teachers to work with students individually. Okay, so... Teachers have more time to monitor students individually. Uh-huh, good. Any other statement here that you think is true? The students complete quizzes about video content? Students bring questions for the teacher? Yes. Mm -hmm. Students can process information as many times as they need? Yes. Aha, uh -huh. really important. As I said before, when you flip the classroom, you send the content home and the students are able to manipulate it. They, if, if that's a video, they can rewind it, pause it, uh, listen carefully, check uh, on the internet so that they are able to really understand the content before doing activities with that. Now, let's take a quick break to think about how our students are used to acquiring knowledge. Students of today mostly learn from their phones and computers. Students of today are comfortable with the flip model because it's how they usually access knowledge. Lastly, we know some students learn faster than others. Flipping a classroom allows teachers to personalize learning. Now, how do you flip a classroom? What steps should you take? All right now, I'm going to outline an eight step path that I have successfully used to flip my classroom. Each step is represented with a star. The first step in flipping a classroom begins with the buy-in. Get your students, parents, and administrators on board with the flip model. So the first step is trying to persuade people to try the flip classroom. Based on what you watch, what can we tell people? How can we convince our students to try the flip model? How can we persuade authorities? Think about the easy access to technology that they will have. Many times we complain about not having enough technological devices in schools or where we work. If we share links with our students, if we share a digital material, they will be able to access from their own devices. Even when they are in remote places, it will be easier for them to share information. Now we have tools such as Telegram, WhatsApp, they have access to uh, pr platforms that are free and they can work on, on those on their own. Step two, curate the resources you need to flip a classroom. These are resources for instruction, such as YouTube video, online worksheets, quizzes, electronics, etc. Mm -hmm. Now, moving on to the actual first day of class, classroom management is required 
for a flip model just like a traditional model. Very early on, be sure to spend time and incorporate expectations and procedures as this learning style may be new. Number four is technology training. Teachers need to learn how to curate videos through YouTube channels and create playlists, and students must be able to access and interact with online content. Now mm -hmm. So here we have a collection of websites that you're probably familiar with. Uh, World Wall, download. It is incredible to Kuzlet. see the, am mm -hmm, Kuzlet. the amount of teachers. It's a large number of teachers who are now trying social media to teach. Uh, recently, I joined TikTok and I've seen many wonderful teachers being very, very creative and displaying their creativity through their uh, TikTok's educational videos. And that's amazing because when you read the students' comments, they say, no, I'm, I feel I'm learning. So it is not really about becoming an expert using technology, but getting familiar with this kind of content can give students opportunities to produce language. There is a tool called Flipgrid, which I call the educational TikTok because students can produce their own videos on a safe environment as the privacy uh, regulations don't allow anyone to watch the videos except the teacher and the other members in the classroom. So students can make their own videos they can trim the videos and talk about different topics, post comments on those videos, reply with other videos as well. So you have all these tools and the idea, as I said before, is not to try to become experts using them, but giving our students these tools so that they can use them. Now we get to the actual flipping. And the number five is assign content for homework. Students will access content through videos, hyperdocs, interactive PowerPoints, slides, and much more. Next up, number six. Students work on problems during class time. Students get to work on the application of skills in class where a teacher walks around the room and facilitates and helps students as needed. Moving on to number seven, independent learning. With a flipped classroom, students become independent learners and have the ability to move through the curriculum at their own pace. And the last star in the sky, number eight, peer tutoring. Pair up your advanced students who mastered the content beforehand with students having a hard time completing the problems. So what does it actually look like? The traditional model has students attending school where content is delivered by teachers and students going home to work on problems. But here we are getting rid of that model and replacing it with a flip model. In the flip model, students work on problems when they are at school and when students are at home, content is delivered online. Here are a couple tools you may need when flipping a classroom. YouTube will allow you to provide video lessons. Social media can help disseminate content. Devices to access online content. Google Doc links. Slides to learn content and sites to find the content. Readings can be used as well. Mm -hmm. So here you can see how the flip model differs from the conventional one because in the classroom, the students focus on solving problems instead of just trying to understand the language. I remember that in one of my classes, my students were trying to figure out how to share the recipes uh, online because we were in, in the lockdown. So what they did was to work on the ingredients, design the recipes on their own. And when they were in the classroom, they were practicing and trying to share what they were going to say in their videos. And the other students were just listening and trying to provide some feedback on pronunciation on probably saying, oh, you need this ingredient as well. So it was really nice to see the students interacting and thinking about how to explain others how to cook tacos instead of just thinking about what the meaning of uh, 
or cebolla. How do you say cebolla in English? Because they were just uh, concentrated on the problem rather than the language. Someone uh, in the um, on Facebook was asking about this difference, and this is one of the biggest differences between flip lessons and traditional methods because it is not the teacher teaching vocabulary. It is the students trying to find what, which vocabulary they need to present the recipes in the case of preparing something to eat and making a video about it. Okay, let's take a look at the other model here. So let's watch now the one about task-based learning, and then we will try to reach some conclusions. Hello, TEFL students. In this video, I'm gonna demo for you a task-based learning activity. The topic is planning a party. This topic can be used with a wide range in ages and levels with adjustments. The structure of the video follows four stages, the pre-task, task preparation, during task, and post task. Let's get started. Step one is the pre-task. The pre-task stage should mentally and linguistically prepare your students for the upcoming task ahead. There are many ways to do this. In this demo, I show you three ideas. Okay, so let's take a look here. It's much better. So as you can see here, one biggest difference between the traditional methods and task-based learning is that we provide the students with authentic tasks, things that we do on a regular basis. We invite people for, to a party, so we plan a party. That's going to be my task. Or... I'm going to apply for a job now, now that I am graduating from the university. So I will perform a role play uh, in which I will apply for a job. I will send a CV. So that means that I, I will have to learn how to write a CV. I will have to perform in the job interview and talk about my strengths and weaknesses so I can role play uh, that task in order to use the language authentically. For the upcoming task ahead. There are many ways to do this. In this demo, I show you three ideas. Okay, so remember, it is important to prepare the student for the task. If they are planning a party, so let's talk about parties first. What do we usually do when we organize parties? Who do you invite? How do you make decisions on what to eat? So when the students start activating their schemata and experiences about past parties, they will be able to produce language with the teacher's uh, help. And of course, this will raise interest in the task because it is related to their personal life. Okay, what makes a good party? Jorge? Okay, okay, uh-huh. Idea number one would be the use of brainstorming with a word web. Okay, in your groups, I want you to keep going, okay? Keep going. What do you think? What are some things that make a good... Mm -hmm. So as you can see here, the teacher is not telling the students uh, what to do at parties. She's simply eliciting answers from students and it is the students who are producing the language. While this happens, uh, the teacher simply has the opportunity to monitor what they're doing and try to measure which are my students' strengths and weaknesses. Perhaps I have a student who's very shy to speak in, in public but when he's engaged in these sort of activities, working in small groups, he feels more confident because that student loves parties. And in that way, it is easier to rely on the learner's experiences and you're setting a more student-centered environment. Party. What are the 
Brainstorm idea number two would be the use of pictures and or discussion questions. Okay, let's take a look at picture number one. What are they doing? Good, all right? They are ordering, all right? They are ordering food for the party, good. Another one. And perhaps the most common activity would be idea number three having your students read or listen to a model text that mimics the language they will use in the task ahead. Look at the picture of the people. What do you think we're gonna to listen to? Yes, all right, we're gonna to listen to them plan a surprise party. Good, good. So notice how before we go into the, the, the task, the pre-task is really important because it allows uh, learners to produce a uh, language to activate the schemata. You, uh, the teacher will be able to monitor the activities and you adapt to different learning styles. There are some people who are really talkative. So using the web can help people talk, but there are others who need some time to process the information. So option number three is probably best because they will be reading a conversation between friends planning a party and listening to that conversation. And those are the accurate models of how to use the language for that task. In stage two, you will prepare your students to be able to complete the upcoming task on their own. In order to do this, you need to give very clear directions. I commonly give each group one piece of paper with a step-by-step -step handout or a checklist for them to follow. I want everyone to get into groups of three. All right, first get into your groups. You're going to follow the handout. And then after, give us maybe 15, 10, 15 minutes. Okay, you're going to present your party idea to the class. Are you guys excited? All right, it's going to be fun. Let's get started. So during the task, notice how important instructions or delivering instructions is so that the students know step by step what is expected from them. Time is important so they, they know how much time to spend at each stage of the process and what the outcome is. In this important stage, students begin to independently build their task. Group collaboration and creativity take hold, and generally it's the fun and exciting part of the task. I quietly circulate around the room and make note of any weak or strong language features on a clipboard. Make sure that you encourage use of the target language. After this, the students will then act or present out their tasks. It's the point where I hope they proudly display their creativity and stretch their language abilities in doing so. As a teacher, I continue to remain low key and continue to quietly take notes on the language being used. It's a fluency activity, so I don't commonly interrupt unless asked for help. If set up well, the stage is fun and engaging for everyone. When I'm done, my clipboard is often covered. To keep me organized, I take notes into categories. Only the most important language features get addressed. Always point out both strong and weak language features. Probably this is the stage that I love the most about task-based learning because it reduces teacher talking time at the minimum, whereas students have the opportunity to talk. And while they're talking, I'm just walking around, listening to them, trying to help if they really need. If they really say things like, oh, teacher, how do you say this? And it's something very quick, then I can provide support. But it is them who are really hands-on. So, of course, some of the behaviors that teachers should show during the, these stages to just keep uh, observing, making notes, don't interrupt if that's not necessary. To complete the activity, I address those key language features on the board with the class 
and we reflect on the language we've learned through completing the task. This concludes my demo video. And as you can see, the post task is really where the teacher has the opportunity to show up language and help. Uh, for instance, if you're familiar with these agony aunt tasks where students can read different people's problems and decide which one is like the biggest problem. It is fun to keep monitoring uh, the activity and see what they think about how people feel in certain situations. But at the end, when they give me feedback on, on, on their discussion and I present the language, the language or the sentences that I might need some correction, they are really paying attention because they know it is language they produced. It is not language brought by the teacher, but sentences that they probably mispronounced or the grammar was wrong. So they are really interested. So, all in all, when we rely on these approaches such as flipped lessons and task-based learning, we contribute to developing the 21st century skills, right? Collaboration, critical thinking, communication, and uh, of course, communication. Um, they enhance digital literacy because as I said before, it is the students who use the different platforms, the different apps, promoting thinking skills, empowering learners to take over their learning and making our lessons more interactive and personalized. Task-based lessons, on the other hand, promote authentic use of language, enhancing the independent learning and collaboration, which are really important in today's world. And again, we engage a large number of students. And finally, another option that we might have are learning centers to extend learning through hands-on practice. But what are learning centers? Well, they, they are simply places where students obtain additional experience using new skills. They expand skill usage through hands-on activities and have the opportunity to work cooperatively. Here, I brought a model of how to create learning centers digitally because originally they were stage, stations in the classroom where students could practice specific skills, skills that have already been taught in class, but you as a teacher know they need more practice. Now that I am uh, playing the role of academic coordinator at Cambridge School of Languages, many times uh, I, I've heard uh, my teacher saying, I have some students who need more practice with speaking uh, and, and they need more writing. So, through learning centers, I can set up activities for them to practice that skill. For instance, here, students will be practicing speaking because I, I believe that my students don't feel that confident or they might have problems with pronunciation because they don't know exactly uh, how to deal with word stress or sentence stress. So I have designed these three learning centers. In learning center number one, students will be doing activities like playing with the stress patterns. If they open the link, the links given here, they will be going in breakout rooms or they can be working on their phones if they are in the classroom and they start working cooperatively and uh, they can do something like this. This is a PDF from a Jamboard that I created for my students to work in breakout rooms where they will have to categorize the different words here according to the stress patterns. As a result, you can see this is what my students did. They categorized the words. And in that way, when you go into the breakout rooms or you walk around the room and you start listening to them trying oh, music, music, or it's not 
cinema. It's not, it's cinema, cinema, cinema. Oh, and they are practicing uh, pronunciation. In learning center number three, for instance, they have discussion tasks. And here, when they open the link, they can practice by themselves or they can practice uh, with friends, which is more fun. Uh, they want to go to the supermarket, so they need uh, some practice about buying at the supermarket. Want to talk to a supermarket cashier? Do it me. I'm red. You're green. Good morning. How are you doing today? So when my students are here in the break of the room practicing this role play, it is fun because some of them have problems to, to practice, but they try. And it, it is the others encouraging uh, their classmates to keep on going. And in that way, they gain more confidence. And when they come back uh, to the main room or when we are again in the, in the open session, it is really fun to see uh, how good they felt trying it. I remember once I talked to a student who felt really bad because of her pronunciation. And she said, everyone laughed at me, uh, even the teacher. And I don't want to try English anymore because I don't want to go through the same situation again. When the students have this type of material, they can practice at home and no one is there to judge them until they feel confident to try. And it's, if we encourage them to work as a group and collaborate with each other and, and encourage each other, you will see that the results are fantastic. So again, learning centers are a great tool for our students to develop uh, their skills or to practice the skills that they have already learned in class. That is why it is really important to know how learning centers work. As I said before, you need to identify the skill to be practiced. Then you need to introduce the centers to the students. Okay, so this week we are practicing speaking. And here you have three different learning centers with different activities. Before you open the links, just read the instructions, check how much time you have, and start working. It is also important to document the center work. In other words, you should have a, a handout or a checklist for your students to complete and report what they have been doing in the, in the centers. If they have to practice speaking using tools such as Formative or WhatsApp to send voice notes, it's a good way for you to pick up samples of language for delayed correction. It is also important to bring students up to date so that they are able to practice different skills. If in week number one, we practice speaking, the following week we will practice reading. And again, we will have to go through the process of introducing the centers and documenting the center work. And the most important thing, assess your learner's progress. One, thing that I love doing when my students practice speaking is to create a folder in Google Drive, share the link with my students so that they are uh, practicing speaking, recording their voices, uploading those uh, audios to the folder in Google Drive. And after that, I create a matrix with hyperlinks and then they use these links and they listen to themselves and try to identify mistakes. And it is really fun to see how focused they are in trying to correct themselves. So with that being said, uh, I truly believe that through task-based learning, fleet classrooms and learning centers, we will be able to engage a wider range of students. They will feel more interested in producing the language and you will feel how uh, they make progress through the different lessons. Thank you very much for uh, your time. I know it's been a long and, and, and tiring week for everyone, and I really appreciate your being here and listening to my presentation. 
Thanks Thank very you. much, Fabian, for your excellent presentation about this interesting topic, flipped learning, one of the pedagogical trends nowadays and one of the most exciting advancement, uh, um, advancements in the modern classroom. Well, we have some questions from the audience for you. Sure. And number one, what are the teaching models are principally used in the education online? I wouldn't go for a model. I would probably say that today teachers need to be more eclectic. You have to be able to blend uh, and, and pick up the, the positive things that each approach brings so that you can uh, design your own lessons based on what you believe uh, language is learned. Uh, if you do so and you start trying little by little through this uh, trial and error uh, experiment, uh, you will start improving as a teacher. Okay, thank you. Next question. What is the best strategy to motivate students during the whole class time? Enjoy it. Enjoy it with them. Because if, if you enjoy your class and if you smile all, all the time because you know that's the place where you want to be, your students will feel the same. Even if it is the most boring topic, you can make it fun when you love it. And I think that the best strategy is your attitude first. Once you show a positive attitude towards what we're doing, you will be able to empathize with your students, to identify their needs, their strengths and weaknesses, and to read what they really want. If you prepare a lesson which you immediately notice is not something the student wants, then you can transition to a different skill, maybe speaking or trying some listening, but it is because you are really focused on what you're doing. Okay, thank you. And next question. Can the PPP model be used in a hybrid teaching system? If so, how? I would say it could, but I don't think it shouldn't. As I said before, when you uh, rely on the PPP model, students might feel comfortable and probably bored later. Advanced students especially would want to produce more. And if it is you presenting the language and bringing the exercises and giving them everything, they won't have those opportunities to share. It's incredible when you give your students the opportunity to share what they know. I have students who are doctors, architects, electricians, children with wonderful ideas about the world, about how society works. And when you give them the opportunities to talk, you learn. Mm -hmm. Okay, another question. Uh, how can you organize the teaching material and content to have a well-designed and efficient flipped classroom? I would say it's a matter of practice. It's both. The more you read about flip lessons, task-based learning, the more information you have, but you have to make an effort to keep yourself organized. Um, I started using blogs, for instance, in 2015. Uh, and I remember that years later, I went to a school where teachers were asked to use blogs. And because of the experience that I had with, uh, those tools, I told to myself, I told myself, why should I use the blogs when my students should be the ones designing their own blogs? And it was, it was like the best year ever because my students created their own blogs. They were um, sharing memories and experiences of things they did in class, uh, photos, uh, their comments on different uh, texts they read, uh, in the newspaper. So it was a really productive year in terms of writing uh, because of, of, of those materials. So through the years, I learned how to provide my students with assistance in how to create their own blogs and, and, and 
be successful in doing it. So if you want to try a new platform, don't give up. Start with a course with a small group of students. Once you succeed in working with that group, then try the same platform with a different group or try a different feature of the platform. And within time, you will notice you have become an expert and you will be able to share your experiences with others. Okay, thank you. And the last question, what advice can you give to teachers who are afraid to turn a class or apply technology when teaching? Well, I, I would probably go back in my words again. Just take uh, the first step. Uh, uh, this is like learning how to swim. If I don't jump into the pool, I will simply see the others swimming and having fun. Whereas I will be just sitting there and, and, and I don't want to do that. Just take the first step. Uh, as I said before, you can start with a small group. I remember uh, I used a platform called Formative, which is the one you saw here. And I used to send assignments to my sister. So my sister was like my, my you know, my guinea pig. So she was like doing the activities and I was trying to see how the student visualizes the activities. Uh, so she has been great help. Talk to your family members, ask a friend to help you be your student and see how the platform works, identify your, their strengths, their, their weaknesses and master the use of the platform and then go for the next one. And eventually you will become uh, knowledgeable of different types of platforms and IT resources. Okay, thanks very much for your eloquently responses, uh, having responded to these questions. And in gratitude, uh, on behalf of Universidad de las Fuerzas Armadas Este, we want to grant you a certificate. It says, uh, Universidad de las Fuerzas Armadas Este, Department of Human and Social Sciences, Certificate of Participation. This is to certify that Fabian Chavez has participated as a speaker in the Pedagogía de los Idiomas Nacionales y Extranjeros, PINE 2022 Congress, with a presentation entitled Flipped Lessons and TBL, held at Universidad de las Fuerzas Armadas, ESPE. Uh, the two authorities are signing this document. Uh, Lieutenant Marco Rosales, who is the director of the Department of Human and Social Sciences, and Miguel Ponce, who is the director of Pedagogía de los Idiomas Nacionales y Extranjeros program. Okay, thanks again, dear Fabian, and Let's go to the next. Thank you. Thank you for your invitation. Bye-bye. See you in the next opportunity. See you. Thank you. Uh, now, to close with a flourish, it is the turn of our third presenter tonight, Jose Lema, a professor at Pedagogía de los Idiomas Nacionales y Extranjeros program in our university. Remember, you can ask him questions which will be responded at the end. Jose Lema is a PhD degree candidate. He's a, he has a master's degree in applied research at the University of Exeter. He has another master's degree in TESOL at Canterbury Christchurch University, a bachelor's degree in applied linguistics at Universidad de las Fuerzas Armadas Este. So Jose was one of our students some years ago. His fields of research are L2 writing research, corpus linguistics, big data, data mining, and blended learning. He will present the topic, a corpus-based analysis of cohesion in L2 writing by, by EFL undergraduates in Ecuador. This research includes corpus-based research and mixed methods to analyze language learning writing to de determine cohesion in text segments, for example, local, global, and overall text. 
and whether cohesion features occurring in particular text segments correlate with the teacher's judgments of writing quality. Now let's welcome Jose, our last presenter. Welcome, Jose. Can you hear me there? Okay. Uh, is, that all, is that all right? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, excellent. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for your kind words, my dear Dr. Jumikinga. Um, I still remember those great times um, studying under your, your, your wonderful time at ESPE some years ago. Um, um, let me see if I can share my screen, please. We can see your screen, Jose. Excellent. Can you hear me there? Yes. Okay, good. Um, hello, everybody, again. Uh, during um, this uh, talk, I will identify, or I will try to identify the effects of considering the main issues around the analysis of cohesion in L2 writing by EFL undergraduate students in our country. Um, I don't know if, if it is this slide, uh, the next slide is coming or not yet. Okay, we are seeing an overview cohesion in L2 writing. Okay, That's good. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it's all right. So um, in, this, in this presentation, I'm, I'm planning to divide, uh, divide it in, in the following parts that you see in front of, in front of you. Um, but before I start, it is necessary to me to define what I mean by cohesion. Um, considering the theory, Cohesion is related to lexical and grammatical features that allow speakers, in this case, L2 writers, to build, to construct relations of meaning in different parts of a text. Um, for the analysis, I collected essays and emails written by undergraduate students in various universities here in our country. My interest in the analysis of cohesion of real life writings stems from the very disappointing learning outcomes during the last day in Ecuador. Looking at the, at the problems faced by L2 writers, we can see that cohesion uh, has been mishandled in the curriculum set mainly by the uh, ubiquitous uh, common European framework standards. The evidence uh, indicates that students rely on grammatical and lexical specific cohesion features present at the sentence, uh, at the paragraph and the entire levels, as you can see here in, in these two texts. Uh, so we have here, uh, these um, cohesion uh, features that allow um, writers and speakers to make relations of meaning uh, between within sentences, between sentences, between paragraphs and the entire text, as you can see here in, the, in these two texts. It is, ex it is expected that the outcomes of this study um, enable course planners L2 educators, materials developers, and evaluators to undertake joint decision-making for the teaching, learning, and assessment of cohesion in L2 writing. Well, that is the idea. Having said that, now let's consider what is happening with um, L2 writing 
in, in the region. Um, so the question here is, what is happening with L, L2 learning and more specifically with L2 writing? Well, past and recent reports, such as the EF English Proficiency Index, the British Council and other official reports and, and very, very few research uh, projects suggest that L2 learners in this part of the world here, as you can see here, I'm, I'm talking about Latin American countries mainly, um, face challenges related to unclear L2 learning standards and challenging um, assessment descriptors. As the map suggests, L2 achievement in the region and classified in various proficiency scale of less and more advanced learners, as you can see here, um, this map shows that along with Mexico, which is here, our country, Ecuador, is at the bottom of the English proficiency index. Now, let's consider theoretical approaches to the study of cohesion, which have been widely described by academics such as Halliday and Hassan and their, uh, in their book uh, on cohesion uh, published in 1976. This was uh, their, a seminal work on, on the study of cohesion in English, but interestingly, not only in English, but it can be applied to Spanish, to Chinese and other languages as well. More recently, and with the progress of technology in the area of discourse analysis, of uh, automatic discourse analysis, other academics have taken a more hands-on approach to automatically identify cohesion features. McNamara and colleagues in 2004, for example, developed the online base automatic analyzer cometrics, the one that you see here in front of you, and that you can also download it if you're interested in this fascinating area of research. Um, similarly, following that trend, that tendency in the use of natural language processing software for the massive analysis of cohesion features in L1 and L2 writing, Crossley, Kyle, and McNamara develop the TACO tool, the tool for the automatic analysis of cohesion. Um, in a way, TACO is the upgraded version of, of Cometrics with more um, variables, more indexes, different um, um, options to analyze written and oral texts. Fundamentally, uh, focusing on cohesion features used by undergraduate writers studying English at the B2 level and required uh, by the CEFR standards for L2 instruction. The main objective of this study was to determine the nature of cohesion in L2 writing and whether cohesion features happening in different parts uh, of the text, such as uh, be, be, uh, within sentences, between sentences, between paragraphs and the whole text, um, indicate a relationship with the teacher's scores or teacher judgments of writing quality. To examine the evidence base, um, I conducted a systematic literature review on cohesion and in L2 writing. Uh, the, the aims to, for that was to help define the objectives of the study, to identify relevant references that have a relationship between in, the inclusion criteria, 
and the proposed research question. Um, select relevant studies by using a repetitive or iterative approach for, ex for extracting data. Uh, to do that, I, I use or I use this Cochrane uh, protocol, which is quite uh, popular in the medical research uh, area. In addition to that, I use different uh, academic uh, different uh, academic databases and journals in L two writing. Those academic uh, uh, journals and, and, and databases included the Scopus, Science Direct, L, excuse me, L two journals, um, and also a, refer a, a couple of referential organizers. One of them, a well known called EngNote and also an NVivo software. And, and I, here I, got, I have got some screenshots of those, of those uh, uh, tools that I used to, to organize my systematic literature review. Um, so here we have, here I included the different um, uh, academic databases here on the left-hand side. And the search terms, I included also some Boolean search terms and also the, um, the different uh, search criteria, okay? After that, uh, I, I organize uh, the, my, the EndNote uh, referential organize, uh, or, uh, organizer, sorry, uh, according to the different objectives, uh, diff the, different, the different types of information that I was interested in. And finally, on the right-hand side of, of your screens, uh, here you have, here I use another um, document which is taken from a, the PRISMA protocol. So to organize all those different references. Well, once the identification of the references was completed, the criteria for screening the collected information focus on the, the use of cohesion by second language writers mainly. So, to organize the, those uh, references, the, the selected references, the, the ones that were uh, relevant for my study, I used the NVivo software again to, that allowed me to specify and organize the main themes for the study. I don't know if you can see here in front of you, uh, depending on the, on the, on the findings or on, on, the, on the articles, I organized that information in different, in different topics, such as the referentials. So the referential is a type of cohesion uh, feature, connectives or conjunctions, meta discourse markers, lexical cohesion uh, features, cohesion and metacognition, cohesion and development, uh, cohesion and the text types or, or genres, and the mistakes made by L2 writers when they try to use these cohesive devi de devices in their compositions. Um, but once the literature on cohesion was examined, I had to uh, think about the methodology. So let me move on to the, the research uh, design adopted for this study. For the analysis of cohesion, my study involved the building of a corpus of 240 essays and 240 emails. Uh, the collected compositions came from writing tasks uh, aimed to assess the student's performance at the B2 level. More relevant, this study here uh, is that the teacher judgments of writing quality serve as a dependent variable for the quantitative analysis. In other words, as you can see here, so besides the, along with the, 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 um, the collection on, and the making of the, of the corpus, so, uh, so the, the texts were one, one group of texts uh, from different universities, and the other group of texts were essays and emails. But more importantly, what, what was here was that they included the teacher judgments of writing quality, you know, the teacher's scores for each, for each uh, piece of um, 
uh, piece of text. So th th those those grades uh, they became the dependent analysis. The, uh, sorry, the dependent um, variable for my analysis. Uh, in in addition to the building of the corpus, it was necessary to identify the indexes for the analysis. Um, and here, Taco, the, the this tool for the automatic analysis of cohesion, includes. 168 indexes that you can see here, you can see them here, that claim the identification and calculation of, co of cohesive features such as word overlap or word repetition, that's another word for repetition, word overlap, semantic similarity, connectives, givenness, and lexical di diversity. All these, uh, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five groups of, of, of measures or variables, they became the independent variables. And uh, the good thing about this, about this uh, TACO tool is that it allowed me to, to find out, to identify all the different types of measures or cohe cohesion features in within sentences, between sentences, between paragraphs, and the entire text. Descriptive and inferential statistics aided this study uh, in, making in making sense of quantitative information. In particular, and taking into account the recommendations by, by Brezina in 2018, the, st the statistical analysis included the processing of L2 writing through a specialized software such as TACO. As you can see here, I, I follow Brezina's model to analyze uh, uh, corpus generated data. Uh, these, uh, the, the, the outcomes, as you can see here, so when you, after, uh, once you have used the TACO tool, for example, the TACO will provide hundreds and hundreds and thousands of measures of, of the text that, that I collected. So to, to, to help me reduce the dimensions of, of, of these, of these uh, indexes or, or these variables, um, I use um, the SPSS, SPSS statistical software to conduct different types of statistical analysis such as the Cronbach's alpha uh, factor analysis uh, tests uh, and correlational and, 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 and linear regression analysis. The SPSS, for example, was helpful for checking the normal distribution of the data. Such, a, such a statistical uh, tests included the checking of skewness and kurtosis Mahalanobis distance tests of the, uh, on the selected variables, as well as the um, getting rid of outliers, uh, outliers that can affect the, the normal distribution of, of the variables. Other analyses included Cronbach's alpha and factor analysis tests. More relevant, for this study, SPSS aided this study uh, with model dimension reduction procedures that included Pearson uh, correlations and linear regression models, as I already mentioned. Now, turning to the findings, um, we can see that both data sets, the main findings indicate positive and negative results that predicted the teacher's scores. So as you can see here in these tables, some of them are, well, most of them are positive ones, but there are some negative ones that will affect the interpretation of the data in, in both data sets. Okay, um, based on significant, although weak, correlations, the regression results 
indicate that six cohesion features were the best predictors of teachers' scores. These six variables that you see in front of you, um, adjectives, uh, pronouns, content words, and all lemmas related to lexical repetition or lexical overlap, um, and noun synonym, that, which is a type of semantical similarity feature, and content words and pronouns, uh, also labeled as givenness um, feature. These six uh, variables explain 16% of the variance and indicated that lexical cohesion features at the paragraph, sentence, and the entire text had the strongest association with teacher judgments of writing quality. To exemplify the most relevant correlational and prediction findings, these figures indicate that L2 writers rely on word overlap, such as adjectives, as you can see here, content words also here, and pronouns between uh, occurring or happening between paragraphs, overlapping between paragraphs. Noun synonyms also were um, good predictors of teacher judgments of writing quality. Uh, but not only uh, at the global uh, level of a text, in other words, uh, between paragraphs, but also all lemmas. All, all lemmas means uh, content words and also function words. And they are included in one single group called all, all lemmas or all type of words. Uh, these type, all type of words or all lemmas also occur between sentences, as you can see here in this figure. And content words and third person pronouns identified by Taco as given as features occurring in the entire text. Th this is the, these are the predictors, negative and, and positive predictors for the essay group. Uh, for the email data set, the most salient findings suggest that three cohesion features at the paragraph level predicted the teacher judgments of writing quality. These three indexes that you see in front of you explain 10.3% of the variance. Those indices regarded as significant predictors of the teacher judgments of writing quality in emails involve the word repetition only of nouns or, or specifically uh, lexical repetition of nouns, verbs, and content words uh, occurring uh, between adjacent paragraphs. Those predictors exemplified here uh, uh, in the email group, I mean, suggest that students rely on nouns, as you can see here, uh, happening between adjacent uh, paragraphs, verbs also happening between adjacent paragraphs, and content, uh, and content words to link ideas, uh, to make connections between, um, it is quite interesting to make a specific type of connection, which is called a semantical connection. Okay, so this word repetition is also a type of semantical um, um, uh, feature. Now, let's consider the findings on connectives, also known as the conjunction group by Halliday and Hassan. To identify uh, connective words, described in the TACO tool by Crossley and colleagues, I use four extra automatic analyzers.
Those NLP tools, natural lang language processing tools, included um, the English vocabulary profile, EVP, a co the, con the online concordancer um, um, called Scale, the one that you see in front of you, uh, the end vivo and text inspector, another online based software. The end vivo software, for example, enabled me this study or enabled this study or enabled me to identify and quantify different types of connectives occurring in the data. In that, res in that respect, 243 connective words and phrases uh, clustered in 25 indexes provided by TACO were used for the analysis of connectives, uh, the ones that you see in front of, you, in front of your screens now. Descriptive analysis on the right-hand side of your screens indicate that substantial portion of connectives at the A1 and A2 basic levels uh, was found in both data sets, in essays and emails, as well as a sporadic use of connectives at B1 and B2 levels and a marginal, a very tiny marginal number of more advanced connectives labeled as C1 and C2 levels. Uh, you probably can see there, uh, in the first uh, group of very basic connectives, 97% in one group in the, the essays were, were used and 91% uh, of all those connectives of basic level were used in the emails. 84% for the A2 level, 68% um, at the A2 level emails, 74% for the B1 level connective words, 43% for the, um, for the emails here and 52% for the B2 level for the emails and just 19% for the emails. Uh, for the C1 and the C2, the, the results were, 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 they were very, very, very low, very marginal. In the same vein, to find out the relationship between connective words and teacher judgments of writing quality, frequency and mean measures were used to conduct correlational and regression analysis on connective words in the collected um, uh, writings. Like uh, in the previous analysis, positive and negative lists predicted the teacher's scores. As you can see here, in, in, in the screens, um, you have he, we have here negative predictors. One negative predictor, that is lexical sub subordinate was a negative predictor of teacher judgments of writing quality, but sentence linking group of words were a, a positive predictor, was a positive predictor. And a positive causal connectives such as because, um, those were negative predictors in the essay group. Whereas in the email con uh, connectives, uh, predictors in the, the connect, uh, connectives in the, predict in the email group, they predicted, negatively predicted the opposition connective words such as but, however, uh, although, even though, and so forth. And, and all cause, all cause of connective words were positive predictors of emails and teachers' uh, judgments of writing quality. For example, um, these figures uh, indicate that L2 writers rely on lexical subordinators, um, as you can see here in front of you. So we have these, uh, these two. Um, um, predictors negatively were neg neg they had a negative relationship with 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 the um, 
we teach judgments of writing quality, as well as positive causal connectives in essays. On the other hand, sentence linking connectives, the ones that you've seen in your screens, were uh, positively uh, associated with the teacher judgments of writing quality. For the email data set, L2 writers rely on opposition connectives and all causal connectives. As we can see on the left-hand side, the opposition words negatively predicted the teacher's scores. On the other hand, the use of, uh, of, of um, causal connectives such as because, so uh, positively predicted the teacher's uh, writings uh, of emails in this case. Uh, now, let's consider the discussion part for a more thorough exploration of the results. In addressing the post research questions, this study used the TACO tool to determine cohesion features occurring in different parts of a text. Based on the outcomes reported, the most crucial finding suggests that L2 writers prefer lexical overlap or word repetition at the paragraph level. In other words, between adjacent paragraphs in a two paragraph span, to link ideas at the, uh, at the global level. In addition, the findings indicate that semantical similarity, semantical similar, similar, similarity are uh, known as, um, as synonyms and the different word senses such as antonyms, meronyms, uh, uh, hyponyms, and again, in, in, in particular, the findings uh, suggest that um, L2 writers use, um, make use of synonyms, but one particular, only one particular type of synonyms, because remember that we can have um, adjectives, adjectives, synonyms and adjectives, nouns and adjectives of nouns, between nouns, uh, uh, verbs, synonyms and, and, and uh, okay, we have adjectives, nouns, uh, adverbs as well, could be adverbs, but the, the findings indicate in this study that L2 writers prefer uh, synonyms in the form of nouns, which were the main um, uh, predictors for, for writing for the teacher judgments of writing quality in the essay group. But given as features were also found. So these given as features were that occur in the entire text uh, uh, also predicted positively, or let me see, or negatively predicted, just a second. Yes, here we have, yes. So the, these given these features also predicted the teacher judgments of writing quality, okay? So here we have, okay. The findings in this study, um, I think more relevant is that the findings in this study are supported by previous research. Cohesion features at the paragraph level have been, uh, supported by uh, different studies, um, mainly by Crosley and McNamara. So Crosley and, and, and Crosley in 2016, uh, he and his colleagues found that different uh, types of words correlated negatively and, and positively and negatively, uh, negatively uh, uh, correlated uh, the teacher judgments of writing quality in different uh, schools, especially these Crosley and McNamara, they are based in the United States and they have been 
be doing their studies with, with uh, mainly with the students at the um, college level. But McNamara also crossed the, in 2016, they also found um, that lexical um, cohesion features correlated with the teacher judgments of writing quality. Similarly, McNamara in 2013 found that um, different um, uh, cohesive devices or cohesive features occurring in different uh, parts of a, of a text, uh, positively and negatively correlated with the teacher judgments of writing quality. And, and, and also uh, in a previous study, McNamara in 2010, McNamara and Lower C, I think using the com, uh, Cometrics tool also found that this type of relationship between um, lexical cohesion and, and teachers' scores uh, in different types of uh, groups of groups of, um, of studies um, uh, conducted in uh, conducted in different universities and also at the high school level. Anyway. Similarly, the results presented in this study are in agreement with the theory of cohesion presented uh, in the literature on, on the analysis of cohesion, on the theoretical analysis of cohesion. So this, the evidence found in this study uh, is, can easily be uh, connected or linked to uh, the theory developed by Halliday and Hassan in, in, their, in their English, in cohesion, uh, in, uh, cohesion in English uh, seminal book uh, uh, published in 1976. And, 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 and also in other, uh, in different um, studies uh, and in different um, upgrades of the theory of cohesion, such as in 1985 and, and, and more recently in 2013 before, uh, Halliday passed away with Matheson. So these, all these uh, theory, uh, had, uh, all, these find, all these findings in this study can be uh, linked to the, the, the theory on cohesion. Uh, Rukaya Hassan also, uh, she had this, she developed, she helped to develop Halliday, this cohesion theory. So what I can, what we can see here is that the evidence found in this study can be related to Hassan and Halliday's and, and Matheson's theory and co cohesion. Hoy was uh, another, uh, another academic who recently passed away a couple of months ago. And he came up with this, uh, uh, the use of word uh, overlap, word repetition, but not in uh, the only difference with, between um, the Halliday and Hassan's theory is that Hoy was more interested in the development of, of and the use of cohesion in larger uh, text se segments. In other words, rather than uh, analyzing short uh, text segments, Hoy uh, was more interested in, in very, very, in the analysis of cohesion and, and, uh, and lexical um, overlap and, and lexical anal analysis in, in very long texts. Martin is a follower of Halliday's uh, uh, theory. Uh, there is this, uh, this uh, specific type of, of um, linguistic uh, field, which is called uh, systemic, systemic functional linguistics. And then Martin and Halliday, they, they are the, the main um, contributors to that theory. Uh, Tang Scannon, that was another, another academic, she, Came up with this, uh, with this, um, with a with with a type of summary of what Halliday, Hassan, Hoy, and Martin have been doing for the for over the last uh, 40, 50 years. So that was uh, she she wrote uh, and she came up with with a um, research project in two thousand and six, and there are other uh, um, uh, uh, scholars also. Um, explaining about the, the use of cohesion in, 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 in written and oral texts. Uh, you can see here the main findings as they become the contribution to knowledge of this study. So we can see here in the essays collected and the emails collected, 
So in terms of the essays, the key findings, and I call the contribution to knowledge of this study, uh, we can see that um, L2 writers rely on the use of lexical overlap by using adjectives uh, in a two paragraph span, the use of pronouns uh, between making connections between adjacent sentences, the use, excuse me, the use of content words between uh, uh, in, a, in a two paragraph span. In other words, it is not with the, with the following paragraph, but with the, with the next, uh, with the other um, uh, paragraphs. That's what I call in a two paragraph span. And lexical overlap of all lemmas, as I explained earlier, uh, content words and function words occurring um, at the sentence level between adjacent uh, sentences. And semantic, semantical similarity uh, in the form of noun synonyms uh, between adjacent paragraphs. And given as features, given as features is, a, is in a, another word to, 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 for this, um, um, this idea of, of making connections between content words and pronouns uh, in the entire text. So essays uh, had these three types of textual features and specific items occurring in different parts of a text, which, um, which uh, more importantly, had a relationship or were associated with the teacher judgments of writing quality. On the other hand, uh, the contribution to knowledge of this study is that emails uh, where students uh, were rely on lexical overlap items or features and uh, that they included noun lemmas between adjacent paragraphs, verb lemmas between adjacent paragraphs again, and content words between adjacent paragraphs as well. But uh, before, uh, before I forget, that is, that, that is not all. The essays and emails, there, were, there, there is another interesting group, which is called the conjunction group or connective words. So for this conjunction group, uh, which is labeled and known, uh, described as by, by Halliday and Hassan's theory on cohesion, this study found evidence on the average of lexical subordinators, frequency of sentence linking items, the average of positive causal connectives, uh, that these three types of connective uh, lists or groups they had in essays had a, 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 they were associated with the teacher judgments of writing quality. Uh, similarly, um, opposition connectives and all causal connectives were associated with teacher judgments of writing quality of emails. An interesting finding on cohesion features in different parts of a text and on connectives indicate some similarities and differences in L2 writing use of high frequency words. These findings are illustrated by the frequencies of the words used in both data sets, as you can see here. So this is for the, um, for the level of words in, in all the text, and this is the level of words on connectives. So these, um, these, these figures indicate that more basic level words, A1 and A2 were used by L2 writers. But, but as you can see here, there, there are slight differences. For example, essays, uh, emails, for example, had more frequent words than essays, just an example. Similarly, emails, included more frequent words, uh, more connective words than essay, essays. Okay. Um, finally, let me move on to the conclusions of this study.
The finding okay. is... Oh, yeah. Go ahead. The findings in this study may open the possibilities to explore the use of cohesion in various text types and genres. When I say genres, I mean emails, uh, essays, reports, uh, letters, formal emails, formal letters, informal letters, informal emails, stories, and so on. Um, and also the possibilities to explore the use of cohesion and L2 writing development. What do I mean by that? So this type of research can be used to explore or to find out the difficulties uh, that L2 writers face at different levels of, 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 uh, of L2 attainment. So we can apply the, the same type of research to more basic levels like the A2 level could be the, uh, with this key English exam, for example, in the writing section, I mean, or could be for the preliminary uh, exam, uh, writing, writing part, and to find out and to see what would be the development in terms of cohesion in this type of, 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 of uh, in this type of, um, of writing, um, uh, learning development and the possibility to, to explore the use of cohesion and limitation of natural language uh, processing analysis. Obviously, it is important to remember that these automatic analyzers are, are they, they are, they can have, they can include some, some issues, some problems, so that it is important to see what would be the limitations of these, these uh, automatic analyzers. And, and also, more importantly, to make the combinations with other types of analysis, a less, um, so that could be an, a, a, um, a mixture, a combination of automatic analysis uh, of, of, uh, of text, as, uh, along with um, manual analysis of, of written text. So this could be the further research and the possibilities to explore. Um, as a final conclusion, it can be stated that the findings in this study, um, just a second, um, the findings in this study indicate that L2 writers at more advanced levels uh, rely on cohesion features that go beyond the sentence level. The study concludes that there is a relationship, although weak relationship, between teacher judgments of writing quality and cohesion features occurring mainly at the paragraph level. However, these outcomes need to be taken with caution because other aspects beyond cohesion must have been considered for grading the collected essays and emails. Um, I think um, that's the end of, of my presentation. Uh, just a second, uh, I would like to... Okay, so here we have to conclude. I'd like to thank to my supervisors, Professor Deborah Myhill and Dr. Phil Duran at the University of Exeter and the University of Exeter for the COVID grant provided to conclude this, um, this study as well as my sponsors, uh, the Catholic University and the, um, and the Armed Forces University here in Quito, Ecuador. Uh, more importantly are uh, the people who collaborated, uh, the students who very kindly share their, their, their text for this analysis. Um, my colleagues at the Catholic University, at the Armed Forces SP University, without the support of those institutions, this project would not have been possible. Once again, thank you very much to all of you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, um, Jose. 
corpus linguistics is really a challenging area. However, you have developed a very interesting topic on that. Uh, I can feel the audience applauding you. So it has been a, present, a fantastic presentation. Now we have 100 questions for you, but you will <laughs> respond only a few of them. <laughs> okay, number one. In your opinion, okay, I have really two questions on the same topic. In your opinion, using autocorrectors when writing affects the student's grammar and ability to write coherent texts, and the other one that has to do with the same. What do you think about autocorrectors and translators to be used to improve a student's grammar? Um, that is quite uh, interesting because uh, all these uh, technological uh, advancements uh, have allowed, have enabled um, uh, educators and also companies, private companies to develop commercial uh, uh, software to, to help, uh, in this case, writers. Um, my short answer would be that we can um, use them as extra resources in our in our uh, in our classrooms in our uh, L two uh, teaching uh, our teaching of, of, of English. Um, but it is quite interesting as we were we were we we heard we have heard during this this wonderful week listening to other experts that these tools are are they are are, are that that they are just tools they are not actually the end itself of, of, of education. So we can actually use them, these the, the, uh, online correctors of grammar and, and so on. But don't forget about the, the, one of the objectives of uh, one of the, the main um, uh, findings of these studies that is the ability to, of our students to, to make connections between sentences and more importantly, between paragraphs. In other words, we, we, we should avoid this, um, uh, this tendency to, to overanalyze uh, indi individual uh, cohesive devices or, or grammatical uh, elements. We need to start thinking a little bit uh, beyond the sentence level. And that's, I think that is, that is a, a really um, important and relevant a lesson from Halliday, Halliday and Hassan's theory on cohesion. Okay, thank you, Jose. Next question. Do you think that research and systematic literature support each other? I, I beg your pardon, I, I didn't hear that part. Okay, do you think that research and systematic literature support each other? Um. Yes, definitely. I think we need to have a clear understanding of uh, what a systematic literature is. Um, if we have a, a, a clear understanding of the objectives of our research project, then a systematic, a systematic literature review can, can, can be a really a powerful um, approach uh, towards uh, making our objectives of our research uh, more um, um, more appropriate, I would say. But again, this, we need to be a little bit careful in this respect because the systematic, systematic literature review originally was taken from the medical sector. So the use of this Cochrane uh, 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 protocol, for example, and Prisma protocol, actually they, they were devised, they were, they, were, they, were, they were developed to analyze different types of research but in the medical sector. Some of those ideas have been taken into the educational sector. For that reason, it is quite important to make sure that we, are, we have a clear, under, uh, a clear goal on, on our research uh, objectives. Mm -hmm. Nice. Uh, which do you think is the best source to find the supportive literature for a research? I, I beg your pardon? Uh, which do you think is the best source to find the supportive literature for research? Uh, do you mean uh, the, um, the uh, I, I'm not really clear. Do you mean the, uh, the referential uh, manager or? Uh, I think that has to do with the reference. 
Oh yes, the re okay. Which is the best? Do you, do you say? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> they say. <laughs> yeah, I I really like the end note uh, to organize my 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 references, which included. To let me be straight with you, please um, don't get mad what I'm going to say. It I I included about one thousand three hundred references. Obviously, that was in a in during during these five six years. Of, of getting references. Uh, you will not um, read all of them, but um, you can have these referentials like uh, uh, the EndNote uh, to help you organize uh, hundreds and hundreds of, 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 of references or uh, organize them in, in different types of references depending on, again on the objective of the research. Thank you. And the last one, from your experience, can you tell us what the best way or strategy to conduct a literature review is? Um, again, uh, I think uh, to have um, to have an, a plan, uh, a protocol. Uh, I, I think I, I use this um, Cochrane protocol. If you ask other areas of knowledge, uh, um, they will tend to, to, to have some sort of plan. Um, these these, these uh, protocols, to be honest, uh, to, some, to some years ago, they were uncharted. In other words, they were not extremely clear and not well uh, not shared with all the rest of the, the research areas. But now they, they, we have more access to the, these protocols, these plans, to better uh, organize our objectives at the different stages of our research. If you want to get the, the for example, the, the findings of, 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 uh, of, of a specific area of research, then you can use EndNote, for example, to organize your, your references just about, only about the, the specific type of, of, of uh, um, of information like the findings, like the literature review, like the conclusions. With all, it all depends also in the um, uh, in the plan that you have, in the objectives that you have that you come up with previous to the study. This obviously, as you you probably noticed that I use these 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 approaches, but uh, the the sad news or the, the not the good the sad news is that it takes time and also you learn by doing it. That is an, an iterative approach. You do it once and you repeat it and repeat it and you read and you collect information, you read one. I think in English it is called the snowballing. I don't know if you have heard that, that expression. The snowballing means that, it, let's suppose that I start reading one, one article and then I read the references of the, that article at the end. And the snowballing will mean that, let's suppose that I, I at the end of the references I find, I found, five extra references that I like it, that I, I thought I consider is relevant. Then I will read five more uh, papers and, and those papers I will find other references and more and more. And that, that's what I call the snowballing references, referencing strategy or approach. Mm -hmm. Okay, we appreciate for those wise and clear responses to our audience questions. <laughs> And in gratitude for such an interesting presentation, we will grant you a certificate that says, okay. Okay, we are up to see it. Okay. Universidad de las Fuerzas Armadas de Espe, Department of Human and Social Sciences, Certificate of Participation. This is to certify that Jose Lema has participated as a speaker in the Pedagogía de los Idiomas Nacionales de Extranjeros, PINE 2022 Congress, with a presentation entitled A Corpus Based Analysis of Cohesion in L2 Writing by EFL Undergraduate in Ecuador held at Universidad de las Fuerzas Armadas, ESP, and the signatures of Lieutenant Marco Rosales, the Director of the Department of Human and Social Sciences 
as well as Miguel Ponce, the Director of Pedagogía de los Idiomas Nacionales y Extranjeros Program. Thanks again, Jose. Oh, thanks for having me and um, all the best to you, my dear uh, Dr. Dumikinga and all my colleagues for this okay. wonderful week. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye-bye, thank you, Jose. Uh, please, right now, I want to remind you um, we will post a questionnaire, so please be alert. If you solved it yesterday, you do not need to do it again. Remember that uh, message. Before the raffle, we will have some words by Evelyn Almeida, the organizer of this Congress. Okay, Evelyn? Hello, Maite, thank you very much. But I thought um, Annabel was giving the greetings first. I mean, Annabel is going the ruffles first, and we have- Ah, the ruffles first. Yes, okay. and we have some surprises oh, for, yeah. uh, for the audience. So Annabel, go ahead, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Evelyn. Thank you, Maite. Good evening, everyone. It's me here. Okay, raffle time, the last one of this Congress. Uh, before starting, I would like to thank to the 15 keynote speakers and speakers that have all their contributions with us. Uh, I would like to acknowledge their uh, talent, organizational planning, and of course, academic skills. And I have a message for the community of teachers and students, and this is what that I found. And it says, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. So my dear students, advantage of all the information that you have received during all this time and apply, write as much as you can, and not only for the students, but for us too, for the teachers, right? Let's start, but before I also have good news today, Today, we are not going to have just two winners as we did before. What do you think about that? Good news. It's important to tell you that the sponsorship of these prizes are from the Human and Science Department. So uh, cross your fingers and good luck to everybody. Can I start the app? Can I start? Yes. Yes, I know it. Well, so what I have here is a wheel again. Remember that when every time that I tap on the wheel, a uh, name will appear winner. Today, we will have five winners. So let's start. And well, the first name appears Espuesa Isisa Luis Gonzalo. So congratulations to you. Okay. Thanks, Annabel, for all your support. Thank you. So let's move to the second one. <laughs> okay. Right. Yes. Ah. Very good. Here it says Sanchez Labre and Nicole. Good. So let's give a warm applause to both of them. Let's keep going. I tap again. Okay. And the wheel spins. Lindo Oscar Javier. Congratulations. Do remember to contact us to receive your prize. We still have two, two more prizes. Uquillas Pazmiño, Karen Michelle. Congratulations. And one more. Right? Good luck to everybody. Oh. 
And it says, yeah, Pablo Daniel. Thank you very much. We already have five, right? So that has been all for to all of you. Thank you for your presence. And that has been the last raffle of Congress. And the next one will be the next year, of course. So thank you very much. Have a nice night. Okay. Thank you very much, Annabelle, for your cooperation in this Congress. And now Evelyn will come and will say some words to the audience. Well, uh, can you hear me? Yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you very much. And, and something that we have to, to tell you is that we have two prizes that donated by the whole department, but also one of the prize is donated by the um, director at Lieutenant Colonel uh, Marco Rosales. And one is from our colleague, uh, Maricela Madrid. And other um, prize is donated by um, Annabel Cedeño, one of, of our friends here. So thank them very much for the for the um, donations and very happy to have a lot of winners today. Well, um, let me uh, share the screen if I can. Yes, and first of all, I would like to thank and give a special thank you to Lieutenant Colonel Marco um, Rosales, sorry, my bad, uh, which is the director in this case. Uh, let me change that. Um, then we have Miguel Ponce, who is the director of Pedagogía de los Idiomas Nacionales y Extranjeros. And we would like to thank also uh, one of my dearest friends, and she has been backstage, and she is Alexandra Zapata. Um, we would like to thank also the speakers, uh, uh, the Dr. Belmeki from Morocco, um, PhD candidate Karina Cheres, Master Stanley Avila, Ma Dr. Holbrookman, uh, PhD candidate Sandra Cabrera, uh, PhD candidate Paola Cabrera, also from um, Universidad Técnica Particular de Loja. We also had um, a special speaker who was Dr. Rashid Moore, um, also from UNAE, we had Dr. Diego Cajas, Dr. Nadia Jaramillo, Dr. Hazel Acosta. We have in-house, we have uh, Richard Mena, our colleague from uh, Universidad de las Fuerzas Armadas de Espe. We had Edison Santa Cruz. Uh, we also had, today we had uh, a special guest from Madagascar. We have Dr. Rijasu Manana, uh, Master Fabian Chavez, and also we had our friend um, Jose Lema. So we would like to thank them all here. And I think we have some words from uh, the director, Coronel. Eh, muchísimas gracias, mi estimada Evelyn. Qué gusto poder estar en este espacio compartiendo con ustedes. Hemos llegado al final de una gran jornada académica, de gran esfuerzo, de trabajo, de participación, de compartir, de ser proactivos. El Congreso Internacional de, de la Pedagogía de los Idiomas Nacionales y Extranjeros ha cumplido con su objetivo planteado para esta semana de trabajo, que fue desde el 11 hasta el 15. Es increíble poder ver cómo... Uh, hemos incentivado y motivado a toda esta comunidad educativa, a nuestras instituciones de nivel superior, nuestros estudiantes, nuestros docentes que han participado activamente. Uh, hemos ido construyendo el conocimiento, hemos participado conjuntamente entre todos. Espero que haya sido de gran valía para todos y cada uno de ustedes, porque todos con un granito de arena hacemos que estas actividades académicas tengan el realce y la importancia que realmente se merecen. Eh, como decía Evelyn, tenemos mucha gente del tras de cámaras, gente que realmente hace un esfuerzo increíble para que todas estas actividades se puedan cumplir con gran altura, con el prestigio que tiene y el compromiso que nos lleva a cada uno de nosotros. El haber podido contar con grandes ponentes, grandes expositores a nivel nacional e internacional, la gestión de cada uno de nuestros docentes. Entonces yo quiero agradecer especialmente a la coordinación general, ¿sí? que son nos, nuestras estimadas docentes, la magíster Joana Guijarro y la magíster Priscila Revelo, 
quienes nos ayudaron a estructurar, estructurar el Congreso y nos han acompañado día a día para ir llevando y desarrollando nuestras actividades académicas. Asimismo, quiero agradecer infinitamente a, las, a nuestros presentadores, a los que han estado en la Cámara día a día, llevando las actividades académicas y pedagógicas como son la Magíster Mónica Pinto, la Magíster María Elena Viñán, Magíster José Lema, Magíster Alexandro, eh, Alexander Erazo, Magíster María Teresa Yumikinga, Y también, eh, ¿por qué no reconocer el trabajo esforzado, fructífero y diario de nuestro soporte técnico, como son el Magíster Richard Mena, Magíster Boris Váscones, Magíster Osvaldo González, Magíster Cristian Añemisi, Magíster Patricio Serrano, Magíster Verónica Vallejos, Magíster Anabel Cedeño y de las, la Unidad de Tecnologías de la Información de nuestra universidad al ingeniero Santiago Hidalgo. Todos y cada uno de ustedes han sido parte fundamental de este engranaje, el Congreso Internacional de la Pedagogía de los Idiomas Nacionales y Extranjeros. Les agradezco infinitamente nuestros ponentes, nuestros expositores, estudiantes, comunidad universitaria, nuestros docentes, cada uno de nosotros tan importantes en la participación activa y efectiva de este Congreso. Las estrategias metodológicas, las enseñanzas, los aprendizajes que deja este Congreso son grandes. Nuestro compromiso para seguir trabajando desde el Departamento de Ciencias Humanas y Sociales, con mi persona como directora a la cabeza y con este gran contingente humano que ha dado el soporte y la ayuda para que sembremos una esperanza. Nos comprometemos para seguir realizando estas actividades académicas a futuro. Seguiremos invitándoles a todos ustedes para lograr muchos objetivos y metas que nos propongamos para aportar en el área académica de la educación superior. Muchas gracias con todos. Agradezco infinitamente a nombre de nuestro rector principal, el coronel Víctor Emilio, Emilio Villavicencio Álvarez, rector de nuestra universidad. Un abrazo fraterno y mil gracias. Gracias, mi estimada Evelyn.